uh, we will get um, we will get the questions at the end, and uh, I will ask the audience to write it on the chat area, which they have on the screen, so you can also see the questions. And preferably, I'd like them to write it in English, so you can also uh, see the questions. Um, is there anything you would prefer or you would like me to do? I don't think so. I think um, we seem to be well set up. We'll um, we'll have some fun. <laughs> Hopefully, it will be very interesting. Uh, I myself, I'm very eager to hear what you will be talking about because it's one of the hardest topics, you know. <laughs> uh, we are facing with those infertility patients, so it's very important. Indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going? When will we start? If you are ready, uh, we can start, Professor. Should we start? I'm all, I'm all set. Okay, the attendees. Yeah, we are all set, I think. We can maybe start. If you give me the directions. I'll be all right to share screen, will I? Yeah, you can start, Professor. Do you want? Okay. Sorry? If you are ready, you can start, Professor. Okay. I'll wait till the introduction. Uh, oh, okay, it will take a shortly while. <laughs> okay. Uh, shall I start, Sechilanum? Seçil Hanım. Benim duyabiliyor musunuz? Beni duyabiliyor musunuz? Duyuyorum. Başlayalım. Evet, başlayabilirsiniz. Evet, sonra. dur. Evet. Tamam. tamam. Tamam. Hepinize iyi akşamlar diyerek e, bu webinarımıza başlamak istiyorum. Biliyorsunuz bugünkü konumuz tekrarlayan implantasyon başarısızlıklarında güncel durum. E, ve bu e, webinarda çok değerli iki konuşmacımız var. Konuşmacılarımıza geçmeden önce e, bu webinarın e, düzenlenmesinde özellikle Üreme Tıbı ve Cerrahisi Derneği ve Uluslararası In Vitro Fertilizasyon Derneği ISEF'in e, yönetim kurullarını ve organizasyon firması Optimist'e destekleri için çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Çok kısa bir İngilizce hoş geldiniz dedikten sonra e, tekrar kısa bir Türkçe'ye geçeceğim. Uh, I just want to welcome our foreign speakers. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll be back in English again. So uh, excuse me for that. Uh, bugünkü konuşmalarımız için uh, İngiltere'den ve Yunanistan'dan iki uh, çok değerli konuşmacımız var. Hepinizin kendilerini çok iyi yakından tanıdığını uh, biliyorum. Ama yine de çok kısa bir kendilerini tanıtmak istiyorum. Profesör Nick McLean İngiltere'den katılıyor yayınımıza. Kendisi Southampton Üniversitesi'nde görevli bir profesör. Aynı zamanda da Complete Fertility Center'ın direktörü ve London Women's Clinic'in de medikal direktörü. İngiltere'de eğitim aldıktan sonra yıllar içerisinde çok çeşitli üniversitelerde, Erasmus Üniversitesi'nde, Utrecht Üniversitesi'nde, yine Southampton Üniversitesi'nde, Danimarka'da birçok yerde görev yapmış durumda. Ve şu anda da aynı zamanda Avustralya'da Adelaide Üniversitesi'nde, Copenhagen Üniversitesi'nde de ayrıca Visiting Professor olarak görev yapmakta. Kendisinin e, özellikle asıl e, araştırma konuları over stimülasyonu, endometrial reseptibilite ve peri conception. E, aynı zamanda çok sayıda bu konuda yayını var ve özellikle de e, birçok e, dernekte başta Eşre'de geçen dönem başkanlık e, olmak üzere birçok görev yapmış bulunmakta kendisi. İkinci konuşmacımız Profesör Antonis Makrigenakis. Kendisi de Yunanistan'dan katılıyor. Kendisini de çok iyi tanıdığınızı biliyorum. Türkiye'de 
çok sayıda <gülüyor> toplantıya e, katıldı. E, o da Girit Üniversitesi'nden e, eğitimini aldıktan sonra University of Pennsylvania'da e, Amerika'da, Imperial College ve Hammersmith Hospital'da İngiltere'de e, ART konularında e, çalıştıktan sonra Girit Üniversitesi'nde IVF, ART ve e, tekrarlayan düşükler konusundaki kliniği kurarak direktörlüğünü e, yapmakta ve kendisinin de başlıca e, çalışma konuları arasında embriyo implantasyon, endometrial reseptabilite problemleri yer almakta. Birçok yayınlanmış e, yayını, literatürü e, bu konularla ilgili değişik grantleri e, bulunmakta ve yine Eşre'de, MSRM'de kendisi çok aktif görev yapan bir e, meslektaşımız. Kendilerine de Tekrar e, hoş geldiniz diyorum. Çok kısa şunu belirtmek istiyorum. Ekranlarınızın altında chat diye bir e, ikon göreceksiniz. Konuşmaların sonunda alacağız soruları. Bu chat bölümüne İngilizce yazabilirseniz, Türkçe de olur ben tercüme edebilirim. E, daha sonra konuşmaların sonunda e, konuşmacılarımıza bu soruları yönelteceğiz. Now I'm back in uh, English again. Sorry for this uh, short uh, Turkish um, speaking. But I would like to welcome uh, our foreign uh, speakers who are very well-known speakers and we are very familiar to them because they have been many times in Turkey uh, giving us uh, very nice and uh, informative lectures. So um, Our first speaker, I already introduced him in Turkish, uh, is Professor uh, Nick Maclon from the uh, UK. And he will be talking us uh, about the diagnostic strategies in recurrent um, implantation failure. Time for a new conversation. So uh, we will be uh, listening to him. And as I said before, we will take the questions at the end of both speakers Uh, speeches. You can write your questions on the chat area. Okay, uh, Professor Nick Macklin, this uh, microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> a nice introduction, and um, it's a great pleasure to join my colleagues in uh, Turkey this evening. It's been one of the awful things over the last couple of years is not being able to visit one of my favorite countries and see my friends there. Uh, but I hope to be able to join you tonight. Um, Um, and enjoy a, a, a nice evening also with my, my co-speaker, Antonis, another good friend. Um, I'm just trying to find my, uh, just trying to share my, uh, my screen with you. Can you just bear me with me a minute? Um, hopefully we'll be able to make this work for you. Um, I wonder if you can now see my, my slides. Is that working? It is. Yes, Great. it's working. Okay. Well, um, I've been given the, the topic of endometrial receptivity and recurrent implantation failure. It's a, it's a controversial topic, I think, um, and uh, one that both Antonis and I have been working on for, for a number of years now. Um, um, uh, let me just see if I can get this to forward. Oh, there we go. Um, these are my disclosures, which I think is always important to, to show at the beginning, although I don't think there's anything particularly relevant uh, to this talk. So, This is the problem that uh, people like Antonis and I have when we try and speak to people about the potential importance of the endometrium in re recurrent implantation failure. And there is, and has been for many years, the view that essentially it all comes down to the embryo, that the endometrium doesn't really matter. And this certainly was the case in the early days of IVF and until I would say quite recently, that we were still working very hard to produce embryos of good enough quality for that not to be the rate limiting step. But more recently, there's been evidence published which suggests that you know, we, we are getting very good at producing high quality embryos. And that if you have a good embryo or many good embryos, you won't get recurrent implantation failure. And that view um, has found a basis from in this paper that many of you will have seen published uh, last year now from Richard Scott's group where they just looked at the cumulative outcomes if you had three um, euploid embryos to transfer. And what they showed in this large cohort study, starting with what, four and a half thousand patients, that um, when they transferred the first euploid embryo, there was around about a 70% chance of pregnancy, very impressive. We perhaps have been aware of reports like this, 
And those that didn't get pregnant, well, if they had another euploid, there was another 60%. And if that didn't work, they had another euploid, there was another 60%. And indeed, the cumulative pregnancy rate was 95% is what they reported. So it would seem reasonable on the basis of this that they might state their position that essentially recurrent implantation failure doesn't exist. So what are Antonis and I are going to talk about this evening, I, I, I wonder? Well, I think there are reasons why we do need to consider the endometrium, and I think they're probably quite obvious. The first point I would suggest is that it may be the case that when an, end, when an embryo is of absolutely top quality, it'll fight its way in and be accepted by almost any endometrium. Uh, and, and therefore, in those cases, perhaps the endometrium is not a significant factor. But as you and I know, many of the embryos that we transfer are probably not completely euploid. They may be light mosaics. Or if we do endometri if, we, if we were to do uh, PGT, there would be not many patients that would have three euploid embryos to transfer. And most women with recurrent implantation failure will not have perfect embryos. And I would propose that in those cases where the embryo is not of absolute 10 out of 10 quality, the endometrium does become a determining factor in either permitting an embryo that's not quite brilliant, but good enough to produce a baby to implant or not. And I'll show you some data to support that uh, later in this talk. But I want to start by showing you the evidence, which perhaps you will have seen me show before, but I think that it's quite helpful in understanding that we need to change this view of the endometrium from being a passive organ, which is invaded by the embryo and really has no role other than to sit there and wait for this embryo to stick onto it and implant, to one that's really becoming increasingly, we're becoming increasingly aware how active a role it has in determining implantation. So we need to go beyond this concept of just simple receptivity and the passivity that that implies and understand the emerging acting roles of the endometrium that we're beginning to see. Now, I want to start from this from a slide that, again, those of you who've uh, had to suffer listening to me before will have seen me show on many occasions, but I do find it helpful when I'm speaking to patients to give this message to them. And, and that is that in the majority of conceptions, whether that be in IVF or in spontaneous conceptions, the almost default fate of the human embryo is not to establish an ongoing pregnancy. And you can see that in IVF, as we know, to our cost. Uh, but also when you look in spontaneous or, spontaneous or natural conceptions rather, that we are aware that the vast majority of losses actually occur in this preclinical phase before the woman even knows she might have been pregnant or that there was an embryo there because she gets a period on time and it's not counted as a pregnancy. And I think this concept has now become quite well established. And I personally find it can reassure patients when they are presenting with recurrent implantation failure that this is something that nature has required of us um, as, as humans. It's part of being a, a human in terms of reproduction. But the question what asked, that can often be asked is why is there this very high rate of implantation failure? Presumably there must be something going wrong, which we might be able to do something about. Well, it doesn't take us long to realize that we are special, uh, perhaps not always in a good way compared with other species. And one of the uh, key differentiating factors about the human, even compared with laboratory animals, and perhaps to a degree in uh, even uh, um, apes, um, is this very high frequency of meiotic errors uh, in the human egg. Um, as I say, this is quite an old slide, and with modern techniques, we might even bring that up to 70 or 80% of eggs if you look hard enough you'll find something wrong in one of the cells there. So that, bearing that in mind, it, it, it becomes understandable why the, the woman will need some strategy to have prevent herself from investing in an embryo that's not of sufficient quality, whether that be to aneuploidy or due to some other abnormality. And she is dealing with it, and we can see that reflected, for instance, in the changing uh, rates of, an, of aneuploidy, which, as you know, alter from um, the time of conception through to the time of birth, such that if you look closely enough at embryos at every cell and every chromosome, at day three embryos, you will find that only about 4% of embryos are utterly perfect at that stage. So many of us tonight, and probably including me, I'm, I'm afraid we're certainly not perfect embryos, but we managed to convince our mothers to let us implant. 
but the processes are there in place so that at the time of birth, very few babies will be born with severe aneuploidies causing clinical problems. So there must be a range of mechanisms in place, including that of implantation failure um, to prevent this uh, attrition um, from causing or lack of attrition from causing the birth of babies with severe problems. We need that as a species. So this brings me to um, some work that we published a few years ago, which describes the, the endometrium, perhaps uh, uh, gives it some qualities we weren't aware of in the past, that it may act as a biosensor and be part of the strategy that the woman um, will uh, use to decide whether or not it's worth allowing implantation to become established and for an embryo to be uh, um, um, carried through until uh, term of pregnancy. So what we've basically been able to show and, and, and other groups have been showing this too is that the, the process of decidualization, which we've known about for many years as being progesterone dependent in the human, imparts a biosensor to the endometrium, enabling it to determine whether implantation should be allowed to proceed or indeed whether it should be stopped. And I just very briefly want to remind you or show you uh, some of the, the data that supports this. This is a video, which again, a number of my colleagues in Turkey have seen me show, which I like simply because it gives a visual convincing representation of the active role of the endometrium in implantation. We can see this embryo here is not invading at all at this stage, although this is of course an in vitro model from one of my PhD students, Lotte Weimar. But we can see that the endometrium was reaching out to, to, to sniff that embryo, to test it, um, and uh, actually perhaps even engulf it and draw it into the, into the lining of the uterus. So I hope that that does give us a visual representation of the active role of the endometrium, and that's why um, we should be interested in it. That's why we should be interested in it when we're managing this difficult concept and difficult presentation of recurrent implantation failure. Now, that's all very well. I've shown you video of cells moving towards an embryo, but what, how does that support the, the, the, this concept of a biosensor in the endometrium? Well, this is uh, the paper from which that video was taken, and you can find the video online on PLOS One if you, if you want to see it there. Uh, but basically what Lotta did was look to see whether or not that migration pattern I've shown you changes with the quality of the embryo. And this is the data that she presented there, which showed if the high quality embryo, the middle panel, you see some migration towards the, uh, the embryo there, equivalent in fact to when there's no embryo there. Um, but when there's a poor quality embryo, this is a 3PN and a struggling 3PN at that, um, we can see that the, the, the pattern of migration is very, very different and the cells don't seem to wish to engage with that embryo in any way. Now, this notion has come out of this work that perhaps implantation failure or indeed miscarriage might arise when that biosensor goes wrong. And one could envisage that if the biosensor is not sensitive enough, it would allow embryos of poor quality to implant, stick around long enough to cause a positive pregnancy test and a delayed menstruation, but still not be viable and therefore end up in a clinical miscarriage. So Lotta went off, took some samples from women with recurrent miscarriage and looked to see if the endometrium responded to the same poor quality embryo in the same way. And what she saw here in panel F here compared with C, this is control, this is recurrent miscarriage tissue, if I can call it that, deciduous stromal cells. Then you can see that here, there was much more enthusiastic engagement with the embryo, probably inappropriately because this embryo may not have been planted. Now, what's recurrent miscarriage got to do with recurrent implantation failure? Well, the point I want to make from this is that if we try everything we can, and we do that every day, don't we, for our patients, to get these, implant, these embryos to implant, when really nature wasn't just destined to do them, so we can get a positive pregnancy test and a happy patient, all we may be doing is converting an implantation failure into a miscarriage because we may suppress the biosensor function, um, allow it to allow the, the embryo to engage, cause a positive pregnancy test, and therefore lead to uh, a, a miscarriage. And my view is that some of the study, the data that's come out showing that some interventions help pregnancy tests, but not ongoing pregnancy, 
could be that all we're doing is converting a failed uh, a negative pregnancy test into a miscarriage. And this is something I think we do need to be aware of. Before I move on from this, I, I'm glad to say there's a lot more work going, looking at what's, what, is, um, what is the mechanism behind this biosensor. Um, and this is work published from Jan Brosens, who's published quite a few papers on this over the last couple of years. Certainly he's been my collaborator in the past as well. Um, and, and what the, the concept that seems to be emerging is that this biosensor is, resides in a sort of balance between senescent and non-senescent decidual cells. In other words, decidual cells that are young and decidual cells that are old and less functional. And then when this is out of balance, you will get a, a disbalance in the biosensor as being either uh, too low, too sensitive or not sensitive enough. And while I don't have time to go into this in depth today, one of the key determinants of this appears to be our old friend, uterine natural killer cells. So there's still, um, you know, on, on, on the playing field, but we probably have been misunderstanding uh, what their role is, and we need to learn more about that. We, uh, Antonis is going to be talking about modulating the endometrium. I just want to touch on that very briefly on, uh, and give an example just to illustrate a point I'd like to make. Um, one of the most common things that you and I will try to try and help embryos to implant, particularly in these difficult patients, will be steroids. Um, they're very, very commonly used, and there's an attractive, um, compelling, even uh, rationale to try it. Um, we do it, um, and we don't know if it works. So what you need to do then is go off and analyze the data, which we did a few years ago. It's Carolyn Bones, and I'm one of my uh, PhD students in Utrecht as well. Um, and we published this uh, Cochrane review some years ago now. Um, we reviewed it again in 2012. And tonight I'm going to show you for the first time the data from our most recent review, which is currently under peer review at Cochrane. So please apply the, ne the, the necessary caveats to what I'm going to tell you. But what you are getting is hot off the press, the latest data from the randomized controlled trials using steroids. And I'm just going to summarize these for you. So there are now 16 RCTs um, with 2,300 couples analyzed. And when you look to see if there's any difference in live birth rate between the two, I'm afraid that is not evident. One way we can put that is if the chance of live birth following no glucocorticoids is assumed to be 9%, which we might expect in recurrent implantation failure patients, the chance following that would be giving them would be between 6 and 21%. So you might want to take a bet on that, but you might not wish to. That's for live birth. If you look at difference in pregnancy rates, I'm afraid you see the similar sort of pattern and I'm afraid it's the same for miscarriage rates. So our conclusion has got to be that overall there was insufficient evidence to support the use of glucocorticoids in unselected patients. At least that is what the data is telling us. But we need to look at this in a different way. We have to ask our question, why is it the corticosteroids are not seeming to work when there seems to be such a compelling rationale for it? And I think the answer can be found beautifully articulated in this paper from Sarah Robertson and, and uh, Rob Norman and colleagues um, from Adelaide, published a few years ago now, which brought home the message, I think, very clearly for us. And that is what I've summarized here, that giving corticosteroids is probably doing more harm than good in many patients because controlled inflammation is part of implantation. And if we just go out and suppress it in everyone, we should not be surprised if we're not seeing a benefit. So it may actually interfere with implantation in some. But on the other hand, there may be patients for whom there is overactivity from an, from an inflammation point of view. And here there may be some benefit of giving corticosteroids. So the clear I think conclusion from this paper has got to be that we should not be giving corticosteroids blindly, but there may be patients we might even be able to diagnose who have uh, an inflammatory level which is excessive and may account for their implantation failure and in whom corticosteroids may work. And that is the group in whom we should be doing randomized controlled trials because if we don't narrow down the patient group to those who might theoretically benefit rather than suffer from it, we are never going to get anything but negative randomized controlled trial results. So I'm afraid this is a, a, a problem across our literature in this field, that we see, random, we see recurrent implantation failure as a medical problem with probably one cause, 
we think there's here's a new treatment, let's randomize patients with RIF to that treatment or not, without having made sufficient efforts to diagnose whether or not there's an abnormality that that treatment might be able to treat. And we end up with negative findings possibly because half the patients benefited or proportion benefited, proportion it had no effect, proportion it harmed, and we get overall a negative result. And we're told this doesn't work, don't use it in clinical practice. And I think this is a shame because I think it's uh, held us back in some ways. So we've got to think, I think, I think we, we need to have um, another conversation about this. This is just, I think, another example of where that may have happened. This is a, an excellent group that has carried out really terrific trials of the scratch um, as a blind treatment, just let's try it in everyone. There's no benefit from it. And that I think one reason for that could be the explanation I've given you. But we need to see if we can understand more about the endometrium to see if there's a group who might benefit from it, for instance, by having um, insufficient inflamm inflammatory response prior to implantation where a bit of a scratch might help. And these studies are the ones that we need in my view. So let's have a new conversation about recurrent implantation failure. And I hope that I've already been able to convince you that medicine is about trying to diagnose the cause of the symptom and then treating the cause rather than the symptom. And one of the problems we've had is that recurrent implantation failure is just a symptom, isn't it? It's just something that patients present with. So if we are unable to diagnose the cause, then we really mustn't expect to stumble upon uh, a treatment that will help everyone. So that to, see, to, to me seems to be a very basic proposition. And that is that there is a range of diagnosable endometrial dysfunctions, and these should be diagnosed where possible. Now that's easier said than done. You know, how do we do a diagnose? But there's an awful lot going on in that space just now. By diagnosing the endometrium, we can move to targeted individual treatment approaches and test targeted rather than blind interventions. So I do hope that we adopt that. We need to make therefore an endometrial diagnosis. Well, how do we do that? Well, let's face it, we're 20, 30 years behind our embryology colleagues who've got now every test available to refine the selection of embryos down to molecular level, epigenetics, genetics, you name it, metabolomics, it's all there. What have we got? Essentially, ultrasound measurement of endometrial thickness. So we need to go beyond that. And we're beginning to. And there are a number of tests now available, some more validated than others, let's, let's uh, admit that, but which are pointing the direction for us, whether we're looking at synchrony of the, uh, of the endometrial development in terms of gene transcription, for instance, or, or histology, immune activation tests, whether we're looking at populations of immune cells or their products, and this is an area where Antonis has been very uh, busy over the years, whether or not the nutritional environment is optimal in those endometrial secretions, whether there's evidence of inflammation or infection there, um, whether there's simply a problem of progesterone absorption, that not enough progesterone is getting to the uterus. And perhaps more recently, the new kid on the block, the microbiome, which I won't have time to talk about tonight, but is certainly something which is causing a lot of interest. Now, as it happens, these are the tests that we have adopted in what we call our implantation clinic, here in London and the one that I set up in the university at Copenhagen. Um, and I think this is an interesting way to go. It's in its early days because as I say, we're way behind the embryologists in what tests we have available. But as we learn more about the physiology of endometrium and its interactions with the embryo, in my view, we're going to see the tests becoming available where we can fingerprint the endometrium, make a diagnosis, and then hopefully uh, bring in some uh, rational, uh, rational treatment. So if we are going to do that, then it's based on one or two assumptions, isn't it? And one will be that, you know, the endometrium is different from controls in women with recurrent implantation failure. Is it? You know, is there evidence that that's the case? Well, from my, from my Danish group, uh, one of my PhD students, Melina Saxdorf, set out to try and answer that question by carrying out a study where she did all these tests I've just shown you, women with recurrent implantation failure, and managed to convince a cohort of women without it uh, to undergo the same tests and simply look to see whether there's any difference there. Now, this was uh, started, uh, this is one of the studies that came from the group in Holland before Melena started, where we looked at gene transcription. And some of you may know this paper, but we found a very different gene transcription signature in, in endometrium of women with recurrent implantation failure 
than controls. So taking this further, what Milena did was to look at more of the clinical tests that I've shown you, where she did this endometrial and blood profiling in a hormone substituted cycle, it's just the sort that we would use for uh, a frozen embryo transfer, for instance, and then took a number of uh, biopsies. Uh, some of the tests there will be familiar to you. Uh, of course, uh, ERA, we looked at histology, immune cell profiling. Uh, we looked at the vaginal microbiome and we measured a number of hormones and nutritional factors and simply looked to see across the two groups, were we seeing a higher prevalence of abnormalities in any of these things between RIF and controls? And the, the short answer was actually yes, but not in everything. So here you see a figure where we see the percent of abnormalities in biopsies from women with RIF as compared with controls. And you can see that we identified slightly higher uh, prevalence of low vitamin D, suggesting that in some, in some women, there may be an absorption problem, which might be corrected with, for instance, intramuscular progesterone. We found that, uh, uh, sorry, with vitamin D, we also found some with a, a, a, a lower progesterone, perhaps also a vaginal absorption issue here. Sorry, I'll just I'll switch this off for you. Um, which might be uh, uh, an indication in some women for um, more progesterone. Chronic endometritis um, was very much more common um, in this group, and that, that's not new. We've known that for some time. Um, ERA was slightly more displaced, but it wasn't statistically significant. And while there was some difference in the microbiome, it wasn't statistically significant in this relatively small cohort study. But I think what we can draw from this is that there are some things which potentially could be going amiss in these women, which might be worth diagnosing because they could be fairly simply treated. But I think it does raise another question is whether the tests we're looking at are actually telling us different things about the endometrium <clears throat> or whether that basically all comes down to one thing. Is it just all different ways of looking at the immune response or is it all a different way of looking at synchrony? So what we then went to do was to look to see if there's any correlations between these different tests so for instance, if a woman has an abnormal NK cell count, does she also have an, an abnormal ERA test? And if so, is that always the same abnormality? This is a paper we published uh, in, uh, last year where we actually looked and, and, and reported at this uh, analysis. And what I'm just gonna show you is one example, which I think just reminds us that we've still got a lot to learn. So what you can see here on the left are the correlations, or shall we say the relations between the results of the ERA test, and I think the ERA will be familiar to many of you reporting the endometrium as being pre-receptive, early receptive, receptive, late receptive, or post-receptive. And just looking to see whether there's any difference in the CD56 positive cells there. And what you see on the top right uh, angle, where we've simplified the, the interpretation of the test into three groups, is that does, there does seem to be a relationship there. So it raises two questions. It could be that the, when we're looking at NK cells, we're not looking so much as immunity, but just maturation, because we know that NK cells increase in the endometrium very rapidly. Uh, but it could be vice versa. It could also be that the era is telling us something about that as well. Interestingly, we didn't see that with macrophages or with Treg cells, but we did with NK cells. So if we're wanting different sets of information about different functions of the endometrium, maybe we do need to be looking at different tests. This is just a summary, if for those of you who might be interested, of all the data there correlating the different tests we did with each other. Um, and for those of you who are interested, then this has been published, as I say. So I'm drawing to the end of my, my talk now, and I think, I hope that I've been able to achieve at least some of my goals this evening. What I've put this slide up to show you is really that we're just beginning. The tests I think we're using at the moment are probably crude, um, maybe ans asking the wrong question of the endometrium, and maybe there's still much more that we need to discover. And I think an example of that is this paper that came from Australia early this year, identifying a new molecule that looks as if it might be quite interesting as a determinant of adhesion of the embryo. So it does appear that this um, molecule is a key negative regulator of receptivity simply in terms of permitting adhesion of the embryo. And it does seem to be more frequently downregulated in, in, in women or upregulated rather women RIF. So what they've reported is that during the putative window of implantation in control patients, this molecule rather disappears, allowing the embryo to abut on the epithelial surface. 
whereas they found in women that were current implantation failure, not all, as we might expect, but some, that this seems to be uh, still present, perhaps getting in the way of implantation. So maybe this needs to be added to the endometrial diagnostic toolbox. And who knows how that toolbox will look in 10 years. We've just opened it for the first time, I think. And some of the tests are a little bit rusty, um, but we need nice new shiny ones. And I've got no doubt they're going to come. Other areas which we've been interested in, which we're making progress now is, uh, is, is trying to assess whether in some women implantation fails because the uterine isn't working well as an incubator, that the pH is wrong, the oxygen settings are not quite right, the temperature is not ideal. And we've recently uh, over given a, a, a, an overview of how important these biophysical factors are in the reproductive tract and certainly worth looking at. And we just started actually last month, I'm glad to say a clinical trial of a new device which allows us to measure all of these things in the uterus and the initial data is looking very intriguing indeed. Um, but I won't have any data for a little while because as I say, we've just started recruiting to this study in Southampton. So this is where I think we are in terms of assessing recurrent implantation failure, um, uh, deciding how we study it, uh, perhaps even diagnosing the cause and, and Antonis will, will guide us through some of the exciting developments and treatment here. Um, what I am glad to say is that I'm pleased to be chairing a, a, a group within ESHRAE which is looking at this very carefully. It was originally set up as a guideline group, but it won't surprise you to know that if you, with a guideline, you need some published randomized controlled trials. We felt that there was insufficient to produce a guideline on the management of recurrent implantation failure, but there is room for good practice. In other words, in the absence of strong data, what should we do? As clinicians, we need to be able to do something. So that is what the aim of this group is to try and provide some helpful and sensible um, advice uh, for the management of this difficult condition. So to conclude, I hope I've been able to convince you that the endometrium is an active participant in successful implantation. Uh, the endometrium is anything but receptive. It's very, very active. And implantation failure could arise due to one of many of its active functions. And therefore, we now have to understand those and ideally develop tests for them. They can be used to guide management, but also get us to do the right studies, which I'm afraid to date have been lacking in this particular context. And new markers are coming all the time. We need to validate them, and then we need to use them to test interventions. And that'll be the topic for Antonis uh, in the next talk. So let me just finish by thanking you again for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be joining you here from London this evening. Um, and I hope it won't be long before I'm, I'm with you again at one of your terrific meetings, which I always enjoy so much. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, a lot of people who've been involved in the work that I presented to you this evening. Um, and they're all listed there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malcolm, for this very informative lecture. <clears throat> I'm sure uh, there have been many questions. Uh, which have been cleared through your talk, but uh, we we'll still have probably many more other questions coming up. So we'll go on <clears throat> and discuss them uh, at the end of the session. Now I would like to invite uh, our second speaker, uh, Professor Makrigianakis uh, from Crete, as I told before, and his topic will be manipulating the endometrium. Can recurrent implantation failure be managed by the use of novel research therapies? Please, Antonis. Thank you, Ege. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for kindly inviting me to this webinar and also to thank Nick for the excellent talk. So I think it is really, really cover most of the topic and it is make my work easier. To discuss in this. I don't know if you can hear me or if you can see me. Is it okay? We hear you, we see you, but uh, we didn't ah. see your slides yet. Can you see my slides now? No. Okay. We do not see them yet. No. No. Um, did you Professor, share? Hello. Please click first the 
Could you please click share screen button uh, I, at I, the end of the screen? I, I, the green I, one. Can no, you I see? It in my screen now. After that, you should select your slides. I cannot see the share screen in my. Can you help me a little? Uh, at the bottom, maybe, uh, or at the very top, it should be a great uh, green button which yeah, writes. I know, I know the bottom, but I cannot see. You don't see it. Um, but it worked beforehand. Yes, beforehand, but after Nick finished, it disappeared from my. From my shall I close my? Maybe we should um, okay. close it and open it again. Or it might be uh, above your screen ranges, the dimensions, so that you don't see it. Seçilalım yapabileceğimiz başka bir şey var mıdır? Um, Professor, can you send me uh, your presentation uh, to my email address? And I can share your slides from here. Can you get in my... Yes, now I can see the share screen. You can see me. We see you, but we don't see the slides. Um, maybe we can uh, go on and have a couple of questions. We have two questions right now until uh, maybe we fix the problem. Uh, so, Professor Macdon, are you there? Do you hear me? Hmm. I think we lost somehow the connection. Now you can see me. Um, do you see the uh, share button there, screen share? Your uh, Zoom platform should be open on your desk. Evet, değerli katılımcılarımız, maalesef bir sıkıntımız var. Siz de farkındasınız herhalde. Sayın Makrigianakis'in slaytlarını paylaşmakta bir sıkıntısı var. Bu arada iki soru vardı. Onları belki değerlendirebiliriz bu bekleme süresinde diye düşündüm. Ama Sayın Maklon da şu anda... Bizi duymuyor galiba. Bir daha deneyelim. Professor Maclon, do you hear us? Oh yes, yes you I'm are here. there. I'm still okay. here. Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, Antonis has some problems with the screen sharing, so uh, we have two questions which have um, been uh, here at the chat area. I might ask them to you, so uh, we can maybe proceed. Um, our first question is, what is your opinion on the effectiveness of endometrial flushing steroid or heparin to increase endometrial receptability? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I saw Antonis will be talking about some of the flushing things that uh, are used, so I, I, I won't, you know, you know things like um, um, platelets and you know a number, a, number of, a number of things including HCG but just to focus on steroids and heparin uh, 
the use of heparin um, in this yeah. context is not really, the, the, the biological rationale is not as a sort of anti-thrombolytic, yeah. but as an, as an immune modulator. So where we might use heparin or steroid. As I've said in my talk earlier, I think that it might have value in women where there is evidence of excessive immune activity. And there are tests available, as I said, which can do that. The one we use is the matrix test from Natalie Lede's group in Paris. Um, and, and we find that quite helpful in identifying patients. The concept of giving um, intrauterine flushing is quite nice because we can deliver it locally. But anything like that is also going to have some disruptive effect. It may be washing away some other molecules. So we do need to be cautious about it. And I personally would feel uncomfortable about doing that until, unless first I had some evidence there was um, immune suppression was required. And secondly, that there were some studies showing that it was not going to do more harm than good through, its, through other effects of flushing. But as I say, it may well be that Antonis will deal with this in his talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, this question was uh, asked by Mr. Bulent. I don't see his uh, last name, but uh, I just wanted to state that. And uh, again, uh, he asked another question. Is there a communication between the embryo and the endometrium? What do we know about the molecular mechanisms of this communication? No, no, um, so maybe no. Antonis yeah. will... Uh, explain some of it so we might maybe wait until the end of his talk so we have another question from uh, Errol Tal Mergen uh, he's asking about endometrial microbiota is important as you mentioned do you think that recurrent implantation failure patients should receive lactobacillus augmenting treatments <clears throat> because um Microbiota is yeah. very much Again, <laughs> popular right now. I'm just going to talk about the microbiome, but just let me give you some thoughts on it. The first thing is we're still not sure whether there is an endometrial one because of the difficulties in identifying it without contaminating. Um, that's the first thing, but let's assume there is. Um, there is mm -hmm. evidence to suggest that both the vaginal and endometrial microbiome, when they're disrupted, either clinically in terms of vaginal um, uh, vaginosis, uh, bacterial vaginosis, or perhaps less clinically, but still detectably disrupted as in dysbiosis, that it seems to predict poor implantation. So it would seem to suggest it's worth diagnosing, and there are a number of tests available now to do that, and therefore worth treating. And the, the, the treatment being proposed by your questioner is probiotics and antibiotics. We are waiting studies on that. They are being used a lot. There's a, a big RCT going on in Denmark, looking at clindamycin and an oral um, probiotic containing uh, uh, lactobacillus crispatus, and we're waiting for the results from that. Our own group have just finished a study which we've actually submitted today for publication uh, to human reproduction. We'll see if it gets accepted. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of a vaginal probiotic full of lactobacillus for people with a poor quality vaginal microbiome. And mm -hmm. the data from that is a little surprising, but I, you'll need to wait for it to be published before I can tell you, simply because I don't want to, my poor PhD has done all the work. It would be unfair of me to tell the results before mm -hmm. she can. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there. And I personally believe there is something in this, but again, I think uh, Antonis will probably address this. If not, mm -hmm. we can come back to it in the questions. Yeah, we did have a uh, study which had been going on, although it's it didn't have too many um, participants in it but what we saw as you said already it's very hard uh, to examine the endometrium for this kind of an examination but the lactobacillus uh, was lower in those who had recurrent uh, implantation failure so i see now that antonis is ready for the speech I, I, i'm apologizing i'm really sorry for the delay and... oh, yeah. No I just would like to thank again, Nick, for the excellent talk. I, I really enjoy it, Nick. And I think you put many questions that it's difficult to be answered, but I will try some of those regarding especially the immunology. So the, uh, the question of the talk, it was how we can manipulate the endometrium in order to uh, get better results in patients with recurrent implantation failure. 
And as we mentioned before, in order to have good quality of implantation, you need to have good quality of embryo and also good endometrial receptivity. And as it was mentioned before, if you really have good quality of embryos, maybe the endometrium, it doesn't really matter a lot, but in case that embryos are not that, not really good, then it is really very important to have good quality of endometrium and specifically good decidualization. It was mentioned before that we don't really have a good definition of reef, so we don't really define well what we call reef, but it has been already some kind of definition that it was mentioned before, but the most important thing to understand is to learn very well the physiology of implantation because like this, we can target to the problem and try to manipulate and get better results. So as all of you know, and as it was nicely mentioned before by Nick, that implantation is a key event in the establishment of pregnancy and we have the opposition, the adhesion and the invasion. And we know that uh, invading trophoblast, this invasion is a continuous process from conception to the 22 weeks of gestation. So placentation also is included in the implantation process. And mostly I would like to focus, as uh, Nick mentioned, and most of the others about the immunology of implantation. And we know that we have the TH1 and the TH2 theory. And in case of normal invasion, we have mostly the production of TH2 cytokines and especially the IL-4 and IL-10, that they induce the B-cell maturation and the inhibition of TH1 cytokines. And in case that we have failed invasion, that is what is really happening in most of the case or in some of the case of reef, that we have an induction of TH1 cytokines and specifically interferon gamma and IL-15, that they induce the macrophages, the NK cells, and the cytotoxic cells that they affect the T cell immunity. But we are moving recently for the TH1 to TH2 to the role of the T regulatory cells in the TH17 immunity. And we know that Treg immune profile favors mostly the immune suppression and therefore pregnancy, while the TH17 immune profile favors the immune reactions and therefore it is considered against pregnancy. So it is not only important to measure what is the percentage of Treg or the TH17, but what is the balance between these two. And that's why in case of successful pregnancy that we have better tolerance of the fetal arrow antigens, we have an increase of the T regulatory cells that they are FOX2-3 positives. And in opposite, in case that we have pregnancy complications for implantation, like it is preeclampsia, in that case we have an upregulation of the TH17. And this is what is really happening in case of autoimmunity like when we have lupus erythematosus or rheumatoid arthritis. So some of the approaches to modulate endometrial receptivity has been proposed in the past decade about one of these, it was how we can induce the synchronicity of the endometrium, one of the important factors of implantation. And it was proposed that by performing endometrial scratching, maybe we can promote implantation and life preference in patients with reef. So a lot of publications, they came through the years at the beginning showing that endometrial scratching is beneficial to the life pattern and growing pregnancy rates. However, after stringent interpretation and a new data that came over, Nick saw that publication as well, that could show that endometrial injury in women with reef, the recent RCTs, they show that there is no significant impact on success rates. So it seems like that maybe endometrial scratching is currently under consideration that we can see the most Professor uh, Makriganakis, your voice has some parasites. I don't know if there is anything else open which interferes the connection. No. Or maybe you can come a little bit closer to the microphone because it's coming from behind. Now you can hear me better, yes? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Okay, I start. Yeah. A little bit louder now, maybe. Okay, it's okay. better. Yeah, the parasite is still there, but 
The voice is better. So, uh, as it mentioned before, that endometrial scratching it is currently under consideration, so it is not proposed for the moment. And the second intervention that it was proposed, it was maybe by the using of peripheral blood monocytes that may be promote implantation and pregnancy rates in patients with repeated implantation failure. And this came from the very beginning with some publications showing that when you use peripheral blood monocytes that they are autologous, that maybe you can increase the possibility of increasing the implantation rate. And the explanation about the mechanism that is happening for these, it was mostly that these PBMCs, they can induce an inflammatory reaction in the uterine cavity by secreting different proteases that maybe effectively change the function or the structure of the different surface molecules that they are expressed on the endometrial luminal epithelial cells. So it was many issues to be addressed, like what is the biological impact, when it is appropriate time to do the PBMCs, and most importantly, if it is a better activation for the peripheral blood monocytes. So the question that it came that maybe since the receptor of the hormone of inflammation, the CRH, it is expressed in the PBMCs, that maybe the use of treatment of the corticotropin releasing hormone, that is the hormone of inflammation, maybe that can promote the implantation rates in patients with repeated implantation failure. And that came from very early publication that we could show that this molecule of inflammation promotes the blastocyst implantation and early material tolerance. And later on, we could show that if we can induce the PBMCs with the hormone of inflammation, we can increase the implantation rate. In that case, it's in case that we use blastocyst, but even more recently, even that if we treat the cells with CRH, we can improve the clinical pregnancy rate in case of cleavage embryo function. So this explanation came that when we use this hormone of inflammation in PBMCs, we could induce the production of IL-6, that is a TH2 cytokines, and we could block the interferon gamma, that is a TH1 cytokine, meaning that you can change the balance inside the uterine cavity, and in that way you can immunomodulate the endometrial cavity to have a better uh, uh, implantation rate. Now about the use of HCG, if it is promoting implantation in case with grief, we saw many publications around five to six years ago, showing at the beginning that if you use HCG in the uterine cavity, you could increase significantly the biochemical and pregnancy rates. However, it was a debate that some other studies could show that this is not the case. So after a systematic approach, we just published in Frontiers that show it about the effect of HCG, that could show that if you do a subgroup meta-analysis, in that case, that all the patients that were, it was used more than 500 units of HCG or more, the, in that case, if we are using cleavage stage embryo transfer, in that case, we had an increase in the life birth rate in this specific subgroup of patients. And what about the PRP, the platelet-rich plasma? Something that many people, they try to use. It could see that in that case, that the current evidence support the PRP only in case that we have thin endometrium. So in this situation, it seems until now that only in patients that we have thin endometrium, we can have an increase. And this seems to be happening by some data that already have, that you induce actually the visualization by using the PRP. And this is the mechanism that increases the implantation rate in patients with repeated implantation failure. What about the GCSF? We know that GCSF is deregulated in repeated implantation failure and recurrent miscarriages. And so that GCSF seems to be also effective only in case of thin endometrium of it. So we see another factor that can be helpful in specific cases of RIF with thin endometrium. And what about the use of intralipids? There is only five RCTs that they show some evidence that we can increase the clinical pregnancy rate.
but caution is needed due to the small samples and heterogeneity that in that case is happening. And also about the use of growth hormone administration, there is some studies with not a big number of patients that they can show that administration of growth hormone improves the IVF success rates in women with repeated implantation failure. And lately, the role of atosiban in grief because of the contractions that they happen due the uh, uh, uh, embryo transfer that could show that atosiban administration can improve the life birth rates in women with grief, specifically in case that we have difficult embryo transfer because in that case we have maybe contractions in the production of prostaglandins, specifically the PCF2A, and in that case, the atosiban can block these contractions and increase the implantation rate in this specific subgroup of patients. So atosiban administration seems to improve the life birth rates in women with it, but specifically in the cases we have difficult embryo transfer. And Nick mentioned very nicely that a very hot topic at this moment is the endometrial microbiome and receptivity is a new player in town. And I think that now most of the implantation clinics are very uh, busy with these things. We know that the endometrial microbiome depends on the hormones. In that, if it is natural cycle, or if we do ovarian stimulation, or if we use GnRH analogs, we know that the microbiome, the suggested immunological alterations in endometrial receptivity, we know that microbiome interferes with the T cell differentiation and affect the remodeling of the trophoblastic invasion. And also it is affecting the cellular and genomic instability, while it is very important for the metabolite mediated response of oxidative stress and inflammation. So it is really very important for the implantation process. And we know most of us that how important is the percentage of lactobacillus in order to have good implantation. We need to have more than 19% in order to have good and successful implantation. So is it important to measure the vaginal microbiome or the endometrial? Already some publication that they can show that the abnormal vaginal microbiome does not seem to affect the reproductive outcomes. So we have a marginal non-significance due to heterogeneity. But it is really very important what is really happening inside the uterine cavity. Chronic endometritis, it was mentioned before. Is it the cause or is it the results of the pathogenic microbiota? And it is very well established that lactobacillus are less abundant in women with chronic endometritis. So if you have chronic endometritis, we have less lactobacillus. If it is, if it is less than 19%, the possibility of getting pregnant is much lower. So there are some efforts to alter the endometrial microbiome in women with women. And there are many protocols that they have been applied. And what it seems to be the most effective is the combined antibiotic treatment and vaginal administration of probiotics that they significantly reverse the non-lactobacillus dominant microbiome. So it seems that in that way, by treating the chronic endometritis, you alter the microbiome and you uh, actually alter the immunology of this area by changing the T regulatory cells. So in conclusion, all the novel immunomodulating approaches need further supporting evidence. The endometrial injury is currently not recommended. The intrauterine HCG is considered partially beneficial. The intrauterine administration of activated PBFC treated with HCG or CRH seems to be beneficial. Treating reef within endometrium needs further evidence. PRP seems effective so far and the GCSF and growth hormone may be effective in that case of the endometrium. The endometrial microbiome is expected to play a major role in implantation pathophysiology and reef treatment. We know that the dysbiotic endometrium may be involved in reef, and the reversal of the dysbiosis may alleviate the negative outcome. Atosiban seems effective, especially in case of difficult embryo transfer. The use of CSF growth hormone and atosiban are still to be used only under strict research protocols. And about intralipids, 
they need properly designed randomized clinical trials to allow conclusions by a power meta-analysis. All interventions do not have a clarified pathophysiological basis. How, they, how do they work? It is not entirely known, but it seems that the common, the common word it is the inflammation, and specifically the aseptic inflammation that is happening inside the uterus, and that we need to use it under approved clinical trials with appropriate patient consent. So thank you for your session. Thank you, Professor Makrigianakis. Uh, although we had some uh, real parasites while you were talking, uh, I was able to follow you uh, a little bit hardly, but I hope that the audience could follow you also. Uh, now we have some um, questions. Uh, now I don't see the chats. Okay, now I have it. Uh, before you talk, uh, Engin Oral had a question, so you partially answered it, but I would like to uh, mention it again. He asked, do you have any experience in endometrial PRP procedure? Is it useful for implantation? You already explained it, I think. It's useful for thin endometrium, what I uh, have understand from your talk, but would you comment anything else on the subject? Um, we don't hear your voice. I think, as I mentioned, that PRP until now, it seems to be beneficial, especially in patients with with within endometrium. But what I would recommend, what seems to be very important, is how to prepare this PRP and how you activate the blood platelet cells. So I know that there are many, many techniques because we work a lot and we try to see what is the best activation. There are two ways. The best way is meaning by using thrombine, the way that you can activate the platelets. And another important thing for this is what is the number of the platelets that you are using. And this seems to be that need to be between 700,000 to 1 million 200,000. So it is really important when to put it, how you activate and what is the concentration that you are using. And until now, it seems to be important in cases of thin endometrium. And the first data we have it is that they induce the decidualization that we know that is really very important as Nick mentioned before about the decidualization of stromal cells. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> we have another question from Mr. Mert. He's asking, is oocyte donation efficient in patients with recurrent implantation failure? So uh, Professor Macron, you may also uh, Contribute. Uh, uh, I can give you my view. I, I think, um, uh, again, it depends on the cause. It's going to come back to that. <clears throat> we sometimes see you know, women with good ovarian reserve um, having recurrent implantation failure. It's extremely unlikely that egg donation is going to be a problem there, unless they've done pre implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy and been shown to have largely aneuploid embryos. You know, outcomes from it are quite good um, and I think that it can be a reasonable way to go if one feels it is likely to be an oocyte factor um, for instance in the older woman or somebody with poor ovarian reserve or poor embryos um, so I think it has its place actually um, but it also would be inappropriate I think to put a woman through the prospect of having children with someone else's eggs when there's no oocyte factor so it comes back down to yes for some but not for all. Mm -hmm. uh, Antonis, would you comment on the question? Well, I, I agree with Nick. I think it is, I mean, I absolutely agree what he says. I don't have something more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I should say that in Turkey, it's not legal to have oocyte donation. Uh, so uh, we just have to stress this uh, issue also. <clears throat> now, um, let me see. Yes, we have from Professor Hikmet Hassa another question. Is there any place of office hysteroscopy in recurrent uh, implantation failure cases for checking endometrial microbiota? Should we do hysteroscopy to check the endometrial microbiota? Um, the, the, the evidence supporting hysteroscopy as a routine in RIF is not very strong. Um, when there is some um, 
indication for it, such as an abnormality in ultrasound or concern of possible endometritis, it is, of course, a means of diagnosing endometritis. So um, I think that that, that that is one approach, although we can look at uh, uh, immunohistological um, markers for it as well. I'm not sure it's a process that uh, the procedure is per definition necessary to look at the microbiota. There are less invasive ways of doing that, whether that be uh, a papel biopsy or indeed vaginal swab, which some companies are now providing tests for. Um, so I think hysteroscopy has its place in the management of RIF if you think there is there's some evidence of a um, a diagnosable abnormality with hysteroscopy, but we're not offering it routinely in these cases. I don't know about Antonis. I, I, I agree with Nick, and I must just uh, stress out that with hysteroscopy, you cannot diagnose the microbiota. Actually, you need to take a piece of endometrium like with a patel, or I mean, and specifically, with some people I know that they try to correlate the chronic endometritis by the view that you have with hysteroscopy, but, but there is not uh, really, the, the sensitivity is not really very high. So definitely you just need a little piece by the tip of the catheter, especially what we perform with NGS, that you look on the, on the microbiome. So hysteroscopy, it's not the best way to check the, the microbiome. It's only if you see and treat something different. Uh, maybe can we say something like this? <clears throat> we are all used to do hysteroscopy in recurrent IVF failure, but the mechanism for it, uh, not maybe for taking a um, material for the microbiome, but uh, when we are doing a endometrial biopsy, we are causing an inflammation there. So if these uh, inflammation markers might have a positive influence for implantation, but uh, as Doc, uh, Professor Macklon said, uh, too much inflammation is also not very good. So there is, uh, there should be a balance between these points. As you said, uh, to give glucocorticoids, it might be good or it might harm the implantation procedure. I think there's, uh, there are a lot of things we should still go on and uh, look for. And just before uh, Dr. Bulant uh, wrote us, I didn't see his last name, surname, so uh, he's Dr. Bulant Tandon from Zeynep Kamil, so uh, I would just uh, state that. We have two new messages. Uh, they are thanking us. And then uh, we have another question from Erol Talmergen. He is saying, would you comment on lifestyle factors or dietary issues for recurrent implantation failure? Would you comment on these? I'm asking both of our speakers. Well, uh, I must say that uh, I'm starting first that BMI is really very important. So if you have somebody with very high BMI, it is recommended definitely to decrease it. And this is really very important because the fatty tissue we know that produce different factors like different cytokines, like the one that we mentioned. So it has been, I mean, there are many studies showing that by decreasing the BMI, especially if it is more than 30, that you have better results about implantation and also about miscarriage. So this is the first point. And I don't know, Nick, if we... Uh, um, there's been some nice studies looking at <clears throat> vitamin D level in, in um, egg recipients, donor egg recipients, to find out whether a low D, a low vitamin D level impacts on implantation if it's from the egg donor. In other words, it's an impact on the egg or in the egg recipient. And the only the only group where it seemed to have an impact was in the recipient, suggesting that low vitamin D may have an impact on endometrial receptivity. The the problem is that to date we haven't seen any intervention trials showing it necessarily to improve receptivity. Our own group published an RCT in fertility sterility a year or two ago where we, we looked at vitamin D and omega-3, what we would call in Britain, Mediterranean diet components. Uh, so you're all full of vitamin D down there. I'm deplete up here in, in the frozen north. Um, uh, and that does seem to help embryo development. Um, so I think, I certainly advise all our patients to take vitamin D supplements and folic acid. 
there is a tendency amongst many of my patients to overdo the dietary supplements. I don't know if that's the case in your in your clinical experience. And I, I have to tell them that all they're really okay. doing is generating very expensive urine, really, because uh, they're exp most of this stuff will just get peed out again. But I think it is reasonable. Yeah. Who am I? I would agree with Antonis. Um, not smoking, certainly. I don't know if that's an issue where you are. Um, certainly we need to, that's a lifestyle factor. Um, and I think the basic yes. good folic acid and vitamin D are important. And, and thyroid, also. I mean, I mean thyroid, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Some of us uh, do see some patients with ha who have a bunch of vitamins, many other supplements taken. Um, it's hard to explain it to the patients also because when someone gives uh, a patient a vitamin or something else, she always thinks it's going to help her. So it's not easy to convince the infertile patients usually. And, and um, I have to say that I, I, I spend lots of my time telling patients to stop taking them. They go, you know, they take everything, everything. <laughs> And, yes. and it's probably more, more doing more harm than good. I try and remind them that, you know, humans, we've, we've evolved for millions of years to have the right nutrition for implantation. So we can't expect too much of pouring in loads of, uh, loads of uh, vitamins, but it's difficult, isn't it? It is difficult. It is, it is. Uh, we have a thanking message from Fatoshi Ustan. She's from our clinic, uh, thanking the uh, speakers. Then we have two more questions. One is from Serhan Jevrioğlu, and he's asking about what do you think about the effect of cesarean scar defects, the isthmus cell, on the endometrial implantation? Because we have, and I think it's a problem also, uh, because we have some patients, especially secondary infertile patients who have already had a uh, C-section, and afterwards, they don't become pregnant. They have spotting all the time, uh, usually. Uh, so what would you comment on that? Maybe Antonis. Well, I, I believe that normally, if you have an itchmal shield, you have to fix it because it is changing the microbiome of the endometrium by keeping all this blood inside and this changing the microbiome of the endometrium. It is affecting all these immune reactions. So. Uh, in many cases that uh, we have this and we check the microbiome in my clinic, uh, we can see that we have, I mean, this chronic endometriitis. So, I mean, I, I would definitely recommend in case you see that. And also the patients, they are complaining because you have all these discharge, the brownies discharge for many, many days after the period is stopping. Uh, I will check the microbiome and then I will correct it. And so the recommendation is if you are a reef patient and you have an isthmocyle, uh, uh, it will be maybe better to correct it. I don't know. What do you think about that? No, I completely agree, yeah. Yeah, it's quite rare. And the interesting thing is that the, it, it exists because they have implanted before. So it does suggest that it might be the cause if they then present with reef. So uh, uh, I would completely agree with that. Yet another issue is we see a lot of scar pregnancies. Uh, it's another issue, not the infertile patient, but regular uh, fertile patients who can become pregnant by their own. Uh, we see uh, scar pregnancies, which are localized at the uh, C-section scar. Right. So that's another issue. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Bülent Tandoan. He already asked this, but uh, it was where Antonis couldn't be. Uh, he was looking for his slides. So I will uh, ask this question again. He's asking about the embryo and the endometrium uh, molecular interaction. Uh, how is it? Would you comment on that? How does it uh, interact? How does the embryo and the uh, endometrium interact i mean it's a i think it's a very large uh, spectrum what she is asking mm. oh, yes. uh, nick, maybe nick and then i continue or you okay, want well, um it, yeah it, it certainly does and i think one of the very exciting things over the last 10 15 years has been our very rapid increase in understanding of the nature of that uh, communication and how complex it is 
Um, some of the work that we so over time alluded to suggested that the quiet embryo, and some of you may have heard of this quiet embryo hypothesis mm -hmm. from Henry Lees, that the, the, the, the, the embryo that's not sending out many messages to the endometrium is probably a good embryo. And, and the idea behind that is that the morphologically, the, the metabolically quiet embryo is one having to work too hard. It's, it's just growing. It's just, it's just uh, um, multiplying its cells and getting on with it, not needing much in the way of nutrients, not producing many metabolites. Whereas the embryo that's struggling is undergoing apoptosis and repair, it's re releasing lots of metabolites. Um, and what our work has suggested, and, and, and others too, is that the endometrium is tuning in to listen to these signals of struggling embryo, um, and that this is part of this communication. And some of the work we've done is identified that the, the, some of the, the, the molecules which seem to be implicated in this are trypsins, proteases. Um, and what we've been able to show is that embryos that are struggling um, seem to produce more of these, and that these are recognized by the epithelium and cause an endoplasmic reticulum reaction in the stromal cells, which is either directed towards menstruation, stress, basically, uh, and therefore not rejection of the embryo, or acceptance in a more of a metabolically nutritional environment. Um, but it's likely that this is just the tip of the iceberg and that there are far more many ones which are positive signals rather than negative. So that would be where I think the field kind of is now, but it's likely that the exciting thing about this is that if we can pin these down, these messages, which make the embryo endometrium respond positively and negatively, we could potentially develop them into therapies. We could convince the endometrium to become more receptive by making it think that there's a lot of this good molecule there or not much of that bad. So that would be my take on it. I don't know about Antonis. Well, I, I absolutely agree that there is a dialogue between the embryo and the endometrium. And as you said, everything is driven mainly by the embryo. So the good or the bad embryo, depending on what is releasing. But secondly, also, if it is a well-prepared endometrium, like a well-decidualized endometrium, can take the message easily and react properly or not. There are many, many, many molecules and specifically latest. We know that this uh, dialogue, it is performed through the exosomes that is produced and come to the endometrium. And now I, I, we know that now we identify every day in another microRNA that is important for, I mean, how to react. So I absolutely agree that there is the most important thing to identify what is these signals, because like this, maybe we can interfere to see how is the better implantation. And something that we have to understand that there are many, many factors for implantation. There is not only one factor. So there are many redundant mechanisms. So if the one is not working, it's taking over the other. So it's a very dynamic process between the embryo. So I believe, even I'm a person I'm working for years for the endometrium, that the driving force is coming from the embryo, but you need to have an endometrium to respond or take the messages properly from the embryo in order to have this dialogue, to have a proper synchronicity for the implantation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question from Belinda Renolo. Uh, this may be uh, a way to, again, explain the endometrium or the embryo. She's asking, how do you explain ectopic pregnancies if endometrial receptivity is that much important? How can an embryo can implant on a tuba or over, ovary, on the ovary? I mean, if endometrium is so important, there is no endometrium in the tuba uh, tubes or on the ovary. How does the embryo implant there? How does a ectopic pregnancy form if there is no endometrium. I think that's it's a great point. Point. and and um, you know it, it, the implication of the question is that you know the endometrium is just a passive organ. Um, I, I disagree with it because I think that as I said in the beginning of my talk I think if you've got a an invasive high quality embryo it could implant into the into the table in front of you um, and it implants into uh, uh, uh, uh, two. I think what we're learning is that the, uh, to me, this supports the notion that the endometrium is more sophisticated than the tube. 
the tube will just respond passively to anything that happens to get stuck there and start invading. Whereas the endometrium has got more of a role in determining whether or not that, that should be allowed to continue. Um, so I think that uh, they are two different things. As, as Antonis has rightly said, you know, the embryo is the, is the conductor of the orchestra, but how the orchestra responds to the conductor is key to whether the music is good or not. Um, and I, I think that the, the endometrium is a much more sophistic, sophisticated one than the tube. The tube will, probably doesn't have any ability to assess the, the quality of the embryo. So that's my slightly long word, long winded answer to a very good question. I, I agree, yeah. but for the history that we published a couple of, I mean, 10 years ago, that even the tube, in the tube, we can identify fine approach. So meaning that it's not so sophisticated, it's not like the endometrium. It is a very passive organ, but also it has its own receptivity. I mean, if you have a good embryo that is stuck there because the mobility of the tube is not very well or like this. But it's a good question that it has not been answered, I think, uh, clearly. Because I can understand, but I mean, if you have a good, good embryo, uh, like you said, the possibilities of invasion are very high. We know that implantation has very common cellular and molecular mechanisms like the metastasis of the cancer. So we know that is very common mechanism. So a good embryo that can implant almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, I'm going to probably close this uh, webinar, but for the last question, or just maybe it will be a conclusion, uh, Recurrent implantation failure is one of the hardest issues for us who are uh, dealing with um, uh, yeah, fertility problems, let's say. And uh, we are usually look at, looking at the karyotypes, the chromosomes. Uh, we are looking at the uh, uterus. If there, is a, uh, if there is anything wrong with the uterus that would interfere with implantation after two or let's say three uh, embryo transfers. We have talked about many options tonight, uh, but uh, routinely when we are in the routine, we cannot do all of them. So what would you recommend us uh, to go with the first, as the first option in a, rec uh, in a recurrent implantation failure? Let's, you looked at the karyotypes, uh, the embryo is looking fine. There is no doubt, uh, or you had PGD. There is no doubt on the um, chromosomal status of the embryo. The uterus, uterus looks fine. There is no thin endometrium, but the patient doesn't become pregnant. What should we do the first, according to your th uh, thoughts, Professor Makarganakis? Oh. <laughs> You have a good quality of embryos. You yes. and everything seems to be right. I mean, and you have three efforts yes. or you have three embryo transfer with good quality of blastocyst. They have been tested for uh, PGTA. I mean, it is known. Mm -hmm. I look about the microbiome of the endometrium in that case to check and see if it is. I will check about the percentage of the lactobacillus if it is a more mm -hmm. percent. This is something because I have checked everything else. So also looking about the CD138 if it is chronic endometritis. So this is one thing that I will check for sure if everything else has been, you know, have been checked and nothing was found. This is the mm -hmm. first. And uh, definitely I will try to check if there is any contractility in that women after embryo transfer, if it, if it was a difficult embryo transfer. So maybe apart from this, I could add maybe something for the contractility like a possible in that case that everything else after fixing the microbiome and the lactobacillus, I will try to help with the contractility of the, after the embryo transfer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what would you think about it, Professor Macron? Yeah, I, I, I would uh, agree. I mean, 
the, the nice thing about the implantation clinic is that um, the way it operates is that doctors in our clinic refer these difficult patients to that clinic. And it's quite good psychological exercise because it sort of provides a natural break in that conversation. I'm going to send you to the special place. We're going to do some special tests. I'm going to come back. And then the patient feels that they've been taken seriously, um, that there's some special things have been done. And it does mean that any plans that we make post RIF for treatment have got some rationale to them. You know, they're not wholly evidence-based in, in the sense we still need RCTs, but I think it's a, generally makes managing these difficult situations a little bit better. The only other thing, there's perhaps two things I'd mention um, that, we, that we would do. I know many people now measure progesterone on the day of transfer, and particularly in frozen embryo transfer cycles. If you're not doing that, do measure it because uh, th th there is, uh, there are, I believe, some women who just are poor absorbers of progesterone. It's something that's very easily to correct. So that would be one. And the other thing is, I think that there is some merit in trying to make some assessment into the immune activity in the endometrium. Uh, it's had a bad press for years for a number of reasons, you know. Uh, the, just the idea of throwing intralipids at people and prednisolone and everything. And I think, but I do think there probably are some patients that would benefit, benefit from some immunomodulatory therapies. Um, and there are different ways of looking at that. It depends where you are, whether you look at just, you know, get your pathologist to count a CD56 and CD16 ratios of NK cells, or whether you use some more functional tests. And the reason why I think it has value is because there are some interventions available. Um, which can be guided. So that would be the other thing. And, you know, the ones that, that Anton has mentioned and what I've just described are what we use currently in our implantation clinic. If you were to put one at the top, what would be your favorite if you only could do one? I'd probably measure progesterone. If you, and if you've already done that, personally, I think probably an immune test. But that would be, microbiome would be coming up very closely behind Anton's. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm I'm sure it helps a lot, most of us. So uh, I would like to close this uh, webinar. Uh, I thank you, our speakers, for their really very nice talk and for their contributions. Uh, I would like to thank all the attendees for their um, questions and their attendance, and also both societies for organizing this session. And again, uh, optimists. For, uh, uh, for the organization. Uh, thank you very much for all of this. And I hope we will meet in the very next future, hopefully uh, face to face, let's uh, say this. And uh, thank you again and good night. Good night. Good night, bye-bye.